Leadership, incompetence and broken promises, Britain deserves better. Give Tony Blair your mandate on May the 1st and let him give Britain back its sense of purpose. If you want to help Labour, please call us on 0990 300 900 or write to us at Free Post Labour Party. That was a party election broadcast by the Labour Party. On the 21st of February 1997, the Bridgewater Three were freed. In 1993, BBC Two screened a drama based on the Carl Bridgewater case. Oh no, the man who did it. One viewer was so moved by it that he wrote to Michael Hickey's mother saying he was completely convinced of her son's innocence. Guilty. That viewer was the foreman of the jury which had convicted Michael. I'm innocent! The drama was Bad Company, repeated Sunday, 10.15 on BBC Two. Now on BBC Two Newsnight. Uh, I personally have always been opposed to a single currency. My constituents know that for many, many, a long period of time. So there's no way I can suddenly say I'm not in favour. I'm in favour of a single currency. I mean, that would be ridiculous. Now a Conservative minister defies the party line. Is the appearance of Conservative unity on their most sensitive issue now in tatters? Good evening. A government minister has now done what the Prime Minister swore none of his ministers would do and issued a personal manifesto contradicting government policy on the European single currency. Newsnight has evidence that the junior minister, John Horham, has told his constituents he won't back a single currency. The policy he's supposed to support is to keep all options open. The junior health minister told us he didn't believe his opinions were at odds with the government. But he also said he wanted referendums not just on the single currency, but on any other significant change in our relationship with Europe. The former Liberal leader, Sir David Steele, tells us the Prime Minister has no choice. Mr Horham must be sacked. 20% of the electorate are pensioners, yet many feel let down and excluded from the process. A group of them take the parties to task. It's been 18 calendar years, but a lifetime in fashion. We chronicle the changing style of the Tory era. And are the confident predictions of politicians on the economy to be trusted? Or is much of the world of money and taxes and the rest really beyond their control? Last night, it was the Conservatives vice chairman defying the party line on a single currency. There was irritation, but she could keep her job, said the party this morning, because she wasn't a minister. Well, tonight, Newsnight has discovered a minister saying the same thing, that he would never vote for a single European currency. He's the health minister, John Horham. The line is clearly drawn. The question now is whether the prime minister will let him keep his job. Mark Mardell has this exclusive report. John Major stressed his Eurosceptical credentials tonight. All day, Tory headquarters have been trying to find out the identity of the latest rebel minister discovered by Newsnight. He's John Horham, a health minister, who says in his manifesto, I am opposed to the euro replacing the pound sterling, since this would take away more of our independence. A straight flouting of the government wait-and-see line. We had the manifesto. Gordon Brewer caught up with the man. If the Conservatives should win the election and should hold a referendum, you'd be campaigning for a no vote. Well, I would certainly be uh, on the side of those who want, did not want a single currency. So it's a referendum, yes. But the official Conservative Party position is a rather painstaking compromise, isn't it? Indeed, yeah. Why are you deciding to break it? Well, I'm not breaking it. I mean, my position is perfectly consistent with the, with the government's line, because the government is saying, we negotiate and then decide. Uh, and that's absolutely right. Obviously, you say that... But you're saying you've decided already. No, I'm, what I'm saying is that uh, I personally am opposed to a single currency, but the government is going in there to stay at the negotiating table to, dis to negotiate, and then, a, in some stage in the future, there will be a decision, 
whether there's going to be a single currency or not. We don't know when it will be. Uh, and then we will confront the question uh, of whether um, this country should go in. Now, if I'm a member of the government at that time, I will have to decide what to do as but, a member of the government. But you are a member of the government now. Correct, yes. But I don't resile from the policy that we must uh, negotiate and decide. No, but, the, the, I mean, John Major's made it quite clear he expects members of his government to stick to the official party line during this election. That's right, that's what I'm doing. My personal view, which I say to my constituents because they're entitled to know what I think, that I'm personally opposed to a single currency. But I think the right line is to stay at the negotiating table, it would be foolish to come away, uh, and uh, then wait to see what happens. And in the, if there is indeed a single currency, then we have to decide what to do. The government as a whole has to decide what to do, and I personally, if I'm a member of the government at that time, also have to decide what to do. But, it, I mean, with respect, that isn't the official Conservative Party line. The official Conservative Party and government line is wait and see. We haven't made up our minds yet. Now, That's as, the government as, line, but I'm saying as a person, I know what my but, views but are. But you are a member of the government. Correct, yes. But I'm saying as a person, I know what my views are. But don't you feel any responsibility to defend the government's line of during course, a general election? Of course, absolutely. That's what I've said. I, 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 I've stated quite clearly the government's line is... Uh, there must be a, uh, we must negotiate and decide. There must be a referendum on a single currency, if we get to that point. Uh, and I support all of that. When the contents of your personal manifesto become known, there will be calls for you to resign. What will your reply be? Well, because I support the government's policy, so why should I resign? Will this count as crossing the line? It's difficult to say. On Newsnight last month, Mr Major was firm. No minister would express deep scepticism about a single currency. No one is going to do that. The members of the government are going to issue a manifesto that will precisely mirror the national manifesto of the Conservative Party. Then the junior minister, Angela Browning, made it very clear in her election literature that she would not support moves necessary to introduce a single currency. The line wobbled. I expect ministers to support the Conservative manifesto and to make it clear that they're supporting the manifesto. And I believe you're going to find that that's what ministers are going to do. Many ministers will have viewers, views of what position they may take at some future stage if the negotiations go in a particular direction. Last night, party vice chairman Angela Rumbold said in her election literature, no to a single currency. For Mr Major this morning, this wasn't a sacking offence. She's not a member of the government. Like every other backbencher, she's entitled to express her views on an issue that may or may not, may or may not come to fruition in unknown circumstances at an unknown time in the future. The opposition are, of course, making the most of the confusion. No one knows where the government stands. No one even knows where government ministers stand. I mean, how on earth can you have a proper government? If they were re-elected, who would be the Chancellor? What's going on is you are seeing the Conservative Party breaking up. The captain is left alone on the bridge, but the rest of them know perfectly well that the ship is sinking, and they are dashing for the lifeboats to save themselves. The Chancellor, opening new offices in Nottingham today, has fought long and hard to keep the wait-and-see policy open. He was not parroting the new liberalism that anything goes. Hello, Mark. Hello, how are you? Hello. Hi. May I ask you a few uh, questions? Is a manifesto no. like this acceptable from Angela Rumble saying no to a single currency? My position is exactly the same as the Conservative Party's, and that would be the policy of the next government. Uh, and what is, what is the position of the Conservative Party? That's in the manifesto. Later at a photo call, I had another go. What about the minister's manifesto? If a minister says that he is opposed to the euro replacing this pound sterling, is that acceptable? This is quite the silliest attempt to hold an interview that even Newsnight have tried for some considerable time. I'm opening an office. You know exactly what my view is and that of the party. It's not surprising that the Chancellor is annoyed and unusually at a loss for words today. He's always been the one who stood like a roadblock in the way of the Eurosceptics' desire to say no to a single currency. But they had an answer to this. They said, come the election, we'll simply jump him, make it look as though the policy has changed, and he won't be able to do a single thing about it. It looks as if that's what's happened. The anger of the Tory left has been growing all day. One minister said, this all makes the Prime Minister look stupid and us look like a disunited shambles. A senior Conservative said, Major is hopelessly weak, he should sack these people, but he'll kowtow to them. And a former minister said, it's disgraceful, anyone with any position of responsibility should adhere to the cabinet line. But Eurosceptics are pleased and want more.
Well, of course, elections should be something beyond a nod and a wink. And I feel particularly sorry for those ministers, many of them in marginal seats, who are not allowed to say what they really feel and the country feels, which is we don't want a single currency. And yet others, of course, of backbenchers are totally free to follow what may well become the party line. But why does any of this matter? Because it tells us something about what a fifth Tory term would be like, something that the surprise victory would be largely down to Mr Clark's handling of the economy. As a reward, he'd be back in number 11, insisting the line on the single currency was kept open. But there'd be even more Eurosceptic MPs than before, and the bickering around the cabinet table and in the party would continue. We'd be back where we started, wouldn't we? Because we'd be watching and waiting in Europe. There's no guarantee there will be a single currency. We'd know that the country doesn't want further integration uh, and a single currency. Uh, there'd still be Ken Clark, because if we won, it would be on the back largely of his efforts, and he may well still be Chancellor. And so um, the Prime Minister would still have the tensions between Ken Clark and the backbenchers, who of course may be more Eurosceptic than before. So um, you know, that would be John Major's problem if he won. Some at Conservative headquarters paint a different picture of a Tory future. One insider told us, Ken Clark has had the party by the nuts. He's not going to do it in an election campaign. After the election, we asked. After the election, the reply came, he's dead. Some think a victorious Prime Minister could go with the flow of his party, sack Mr Clark, and appoint someone who'd adopt a hard line against a single currency. That would leave an unhappy rump on the back benches, but delight the Eurosceptics. No individual, however strong their views, can actually thwart a government, and in this case, the Conservative Party. Uh, and if the, if, the, if the casualties happen to be senior ministers, well then so be it. This perhaps has been our problem. We haven't taken these sound decisions as we should have done some years ago. After May the 1st, many things will change, but Ken Clark will remain a big beast, difficult to ignore. For the moment, the fate of rebel ministers may depend on how hard he wants to rattle the cage. And earlier to David Steele, once a colleague of John Horam's in the Liberal Social Democrat Alliance, told me what action the Prime Minister should take now. Well, John Major is the captain of the ship, and what's happening is that the lifeboats on the Tory Titanic are now filling up, and the petty officers are the people who are leaving the bridge and climbing in first. So I think really he's got to make an example and he ought to sack Mr Horan for not following the party line. Well, joining us now is the Eurosceptic Conservative MP, Bill Cash. What do you think, Mr Cash? He's got to go, hasn't he? Well, certainly not. Um, the one thing that comes out of this loud and clear is the fact that he's being absolutely honest with his electorate. Oh, yes, but he's unfortunately completely at variance with government policy. Well, I wouldn't say that because, if you remember, Malcolm Rifkind has expressed himself as being hostile to a single currency, and indeed in principle. And, uh, I mean, that's it, isn't it? I mean, after all, it's perfectly clear, as I pointed out at the party conference and have for many, many years, that uh, the whole of this single currency question goes to the very heart of who governs Britain. And if a person who is taking part in an election has not got a view on who governs Britain and how, um, and wishes to express that to his electorate, but then I think it would be a pretty, pretty poor show for a general election. Uh, but aren't you worried, Mr Cash, that uh, Mr Horam and these other people are making your leader look a booby? I mean, he says one day ministers will not issue personal manifestos which are at variance with government policy. Then, he, then when he finds a vice chairman issuing a manifesto that is at variance with government policy, he says it doesn't matter, she's not a minister. Now we discover a minister does it. There is no line here? No, I completely disagree. Unlike the Labour Party, uh, who are all being corralled into uh, a pen, uh, which they certainly don't feel comfortable in, because I know plenty of people in the Labour Party who are absolutely virulent against the single currency. They're not only totally divided, but they feel passionately about it, but they've been corralled and they've given in. And in fact, what they're doing is they're trading in the right of the British people to govern themselves um, for the sake of, of obtaining power. And I think that that right. really ought to condemn them in the eyes of the electorate. Bill Cash, thank you very much. Uh, well, with us in the studio now is our political correspondent, Mark Mardell. Well, what do you reckon? Can he survive? Well, it seems the Conservative Central Office have been taking a line that's very much in keeping with their general policy on the single currency. They're keeping their options open. One moment they're deciding <laughs> they ought to be in and another they're out. And the, the, all throughout the day, they've been saying, my goodness, if you've really found this minister, we don't see... How, you, how he can hang on, but the latest I've just been told, they say that he's not going against government policy and they're going to see whether he can try to hang on 
But he is going against government policy, isn't he? Well, is he? It's, it's not quite clear. I mean, John oh, Major... It was pretty explicit in your report. John Major, though, so, did say that they must stick by the manifesto, but also they, they're entitled to have their personal views. When did the Prime Minister hear about this? Only at 10 o'clock, that uh, he was in a big meeting at Methodist Central Hall in central London, and he was only told about it at 10 o'clock. Uh, he was meeting his staff then to decide what to do. So whatever the decision is, it will be the Prime Minister's own personal decision. That's what being told. It is up to him. But I also think that what Ken Clark and Michael Heseltine have to say about this m must be pretty important. Mark Mardell, thanks very much. We'll get back to you later on, we hope, with more. Ten million of the people who will be voting on May the 1st, one-fifth of the election... The general position is absolutely clear. Any member of the government must be assumed uh, to, to support government policy. The public is entitled uh, to assume that. No government can uh, speak with forked tongues. Uh, and therefore, I assume that Mr. Horum does support uh, government policy. So, uh, in those circumstances, he really has no option but to resign, doesn't he? Well, if he, in the theoretical event that a minister no longer find it possible to support government policy, obviously that would be the only honourable course for him to take. Quentin Davis, thank you very much. Uh, well, now, uh, central office apparently uh, are now um, issuing a statement uh, in John Horham's name. It reads, of course, I support the government negotiate and decide policy. I would not be in the government otherwise. I would not expect to be in the future. I thought my support for government policy was self-evident. Otherwise, I would have put it in my leaflet. If the Prime Minister had not negotiated, not doubt, we would never have had the choice in the first place. What's really important in this election? Blah, blah, blah. Now, there it is as it stands at present, and there are noises coming tonight from Central Office that they do not expect Mr. Horam to have to resign. Any further on that, uh, we'll bring it to you during the course of the programme. If there is a change of government come May the 1st, it'll be the end of an era. In our series looking back over how things have changed in the last 18 years, tonight, Krishnan Guru Murthy examines the rise and fall and rise again of shoulder plaids and flares and the rest. Labour on 45%, the Conservatives there on 31, the Liberal Democrats on 19. Now, Mori, a poll for tonight's evening standard in London, has a higher figure for Labour, they're at 50. Conservatives around the same, uh, a rather lower figure for the Liberal Democrats. And you've got the Gallup Daily Rolling Poll in tomorrow's Daily Telegraph. Again, has uh, Labour up at around 50%, the Conservatives around 30. Liberal Democrats rather lower than the other polls are on 12. But as normal, what you've got is a fairly c the consistent pattern. ICM, because it's a slightly different way of doing the sums, as normal, has Labour slightly lower than the other pollsters, the Liberal Democrats rather higher. There are some pretty big differences there, though. What are we to make of them? I think the best thing to do is to try and compare each poll with the previous poll in, in the same series by the same company. Now, if you look, first of all, at the Labour figures, compared with this time last week, they all agree that Labour's pretty well where it was. The same, up a point, down a point, no, no real change there. Now look at what's happened to the Conservative share according to these three polls and their polls last week. They all show the Conservatives down. Morrie has them down most of all. I'd be a bit suspicious of that five-point drop. It looks now as if Morrie's poll for the Times a week ago perhaps had the Tories a shade too high, and that explains the size of that drop. But they do all agree that the Conservatives are down a bit on the week. And they also all agree that the Liberal Democrats are up compared to last week. Again, they disagree on the scale of the rise. Gallup has them only up one point, whereas ICM has them up four points, 19%, which is actually higher than the last general election, if that's true. Um, ICM and Mori have them at the highest since last summer. So there is, as it were, a degree of consistency about the story of the past week. And I think the point is this. One of two things happened last week. Either the Conservatives did have a little bit of a blip up, which led to some mm. headlines and some cheer at central office. If so, it's been unwound. They come back down. Or those poll figures last week were a bit exaggerated, and actually nothing really has happened to the Conservative support for the last month. But it does look that the Liberal Democrats are now on the way up. I should have given you notice of this, uh, this question, perhaps, uh, and so you can always just take it and come back tomorrow or something and talk about it. But I mean, is there any evidence of of how this uh, disunity in the Conservative Party is playing or what other issues are, are affecting the voters? I think disunity over Europe, it, it, it's an intriguing story because clearly all the polling evidence going back two or three years is that most people don't want a single currency. And my judgment is that if the Conservative Party were to go into this election or to fight in this election in a united way against a single currency, they might do rather well. 
the trouble is that what people see is a disunited party. We've got some figures which compare um, this election from five years ago. We went into the last election. More people thought the Conservatives were united than divided, 48 to 41 percent. The Gallup poll for the Telegraph. Now, they've repeated this uh, through, the, through the years, and the latest figure, the beginning of this campaign, very different. We now see, what, uh, four times, five times as many people saying the Conservatives are divided as united. And it seems to me that for every, as it were, voter the Conservatives might gain for being sceptical on Europe, or half sceptical on Europe, they're probably losing five or ten voters who say, we don't want to be governed by a disunited, by a divided party. And I think division actually trumps European policy. So the fact that uh, Labour are keeping their divisions, which we all know exist, but that they're keeping them well under wraps, is actually rebounding to their credit, regardless of the fact that actually their policy line isn't very different on Europe. Oh, well, leaving aside whether or not there are differences or would be in a Labour government functionally as big differences as there are in the Conservative Party under a Conservative government, clearly the fact that Labour is perceived to be far more united, as it is, the, the parallel Gallup polls yeah. are, on Labour show them to be, broadly speaking, perceived to be united. Um, I, I, I think that, again, Labour's functional unity is helping there, while the disunity is um, harming the Conservatives. Um, and I would have thought that at the moment, Europe is working Labour's way because of that un united, divided um, uh, reputation. Right. Uh, well, for the benefit of uh, viewers, I should, uh, if you turned on late, I should tell you that the uh, junior health minister, John Horham, uh, has uh, been discovered to be issuing an election address which uh, is uh, significantly at variance with government policy. Government policy on the single currency, you recall, is to uh, keep our options open, to wait and see and decide whether to join the single currency or not, only after a referendum and when we see uh, what it is and how it would function. John Horham has said there are no circumstances under which he could join a single currency and furthermore would like to see a referendum not just on that but on any other issue which affected our constitutional relationship with Europe. The question then is whether he has breached the line which was drawn up by the Prime Minister uh, in which he said um, that ministers should toe the government line uh, and uh, he thought it actually rather unlikely uh, that any minister uh, would do otherwise, but of course, uh, Mr. Horham, it turns out, uh, has done otherwise. Now, Mark Mardell is here. Uh, Mark, what have you uh, heard so far uh, tonight about whether he's going to survive or not? Yes, well, the Prime Minister's actual line, he was fantasy, wasn't it? A fantasy that this was going yeah. to happen. He's going to survive, and so is uh, Jim Pace, another minister, an education minister, who has said very similar things. The Prime Minister's line has been stretched in an elasticated way to, to embrace them. It seems that they have, I must say, been paraded a bit with placards mm. around their necks saying that we shouldn't have, uh, shouldn't have actually um, been so unclear in our manifestos. Jim Pace says that I should have made it crystal clear that, of course, I support the government's wait-and-see, negotiate-and-decide line. But evidently, as long as you say that first, you can say what on earth you like. You can be for it, against it, firmly against it, say it breaches uh, constitutional principles, as long as you say you support the government's wait and see line. So this they is, stretch the line. But I mean, with the greatest respect to the Prime Minister, this is unbelievable because I mean, he said 5th of March in that interview that we had on Newsnight, uh, what sort of a cab question, what sort of a cabinet is it though where individual ministers at cabinet level and below can issue individual manifestos which may be at variance with the official party line? Major, no one is going to do that. But personal manifestos in which they express deep scepticism about a European cur currency, that, as you say, complete fantasy. No one is going to do that. They are doing it. They're do at least one of them, junior ministers, doing it. Mr. Pace is doing it. Well, they're, they're quite clearly doing it. There's no, no question about that. They are putting out personal manifestos mm. that are, uh, I think your, your words, were deeply sceptical to, uh, to a single currency. What, what the Prime Minister is trying to argue is that as long as you stick to the narrow wait and see, then everything else goes. But, but it's very interesting to note that what doesn't seem to go is saying that you're, uh, you're pro-European, you're pro a single mm. currency. Isn't, Peter Cummer. Isn't part of the problem with this that uh, if John Major were to sack John Horan, that would unleash a torrential backlash from the Eurosceptical wing of the Tory party. And therefore, John Major is caught between two impossible decisions, two impossible choices, it seems to me. But in the uh, meantime... I, 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 either, to, either to try and bend what he said over the last few weeks, and to prevent that torrential backlash, or to stick by rigidly what he said over the last few weeks and lead his party to civil war with a fortnight to go to polling day. But in the meantime, we have um, 
a succession of newspaper investigators. Look, you know, we're as guilty of it as, as anybody else. I mean, you hear that a government minister is defying the party line, of course you want to find out what it is. The Times tomorrow morning has this whole, all over its front page. Ministers of more than 120 candidates disclose their opposition to a single currency. They've gone round, they've called the ministers, they've called their agents, they've got the, what the leaflet says, what the unattributable sources at the party headquarters are saying locally. I mean, it just runs and runs. But, but well, I think, I think the thing is that they, we, we've heard from central office that they aren't really too unhappy. Of course, they're unhappy for the reasons we've just been discussing, that disunity comes out, that there's fighting. But the idea that the Conservative Party is basically a Eurosceptic party, they're quite happy for that to come out, because it makes it very, very difficult for those senior figures in the government who've been fighting extremely hard. I thought it was very telling that when I caught up with Ken Clark and he knew we were going to right. come, we knew we were going to ask yeah. him questions, he couldn't even make pro-European, pro-single currency noises. He could walk pretty fast, though. <laughs> <laughs> I kept up with him. <laughs> Uh, and uh, for the benefit of viewers at home, I should tell you that we asked the uh, Labour Party to come on and uh, talk about it. Uh, you might have thought it was an open goal, but uh, they declined the chance to kick at it. Uh, no, there we are. Uh, there's that front page of the Times uh, I was referring to a moment ago. Uh, Tories rush into ranks of Eurosceptics. Financial Times ministers break EMU line, that John Horham story that we broke earlier tonight. One Nation wants more the new uh, manifesto being uh, launched. And it's time to come clean on Europe is the Daily Express's uh, front page leader on... Uh, the Tories in Europe. That's all from News Night tonight. Kirsty will be back with more tomorrow night. Radio 5 Live interviews Tony Blair in the Sybil Rusco show just after the two o'clock news tomorrow. But until tomorrow night, from all of us on the programme, good night. <laughs>